one, two. Yep. People hear me? Yeah, I can. Okay, so next up, we're going to have Taiko Anderson and Mike McCracken. They're going to be talking to us about Creo LXC. Try OLXC, whichever way, how's that thing? Which that actually, stuff. according to the diagram earlier in one of the talks today, I think we should rename this to um, something else. OCI LXC, uh, when we named it, we didn't understand what we were doing. And we still don't. So uh, anyway, I'm Tycho. This is Mike. We work at Cisco. We do stuff. One of the things I gave a talk here last year about uh, using OCI images with, uh, without um, the tar all the traditional stuff, but in, in uh, putting other things in here. So I just want to go over this a little bit. Um, for starters, I'm going to talk a little bit about what the OCI format looks like. So it looks like this, roughly. Um, and this OCI layout file, uh, you can tell that there's a version. Um, I guess this is all not aligned again. We tried to fix this. Anyway, uh, cool. So Imagine the arrows are one up. Uh, somehow the slides don't align. But so basically, the index points to a, um, a, a like a, a blob, and that blob is really just a JSON blob, which itself points to a configuration, which then that configuration points to some layers. And so the layers are these uh, com gzip compressed tarballs with the file system state on them and whiteouts and all that stuff. Um, and so this is sort of what a traditional OCI image looks like if you're using uh, an OCI-based runtime today, this is what you're using. Um, and there's uh, some drawbacks. Um, for example, each layer is a tar file, so there's no dedupe. So for example, if you include the same file in two different layers, there's no intelligence there. The file just gets included twice. Uh, or if you, say, modify one byte of a particular file in a container image, that in, in the file is a gigabyte long and you change one byte, the way that the OCI format is designed today, you include that file again verbatim, not just the one byte change, which is sort of annoying. Um, the whiteouts are, are painful. Uh, you have, it's like a specially named file, but what if you do if you have a file in your image called .wh? Uh, large layers are painful. Um, you can't seek in tarballs. Um, actually, there's I, uh, if you know Alexa, he wrote a large blog post about why tar is a bad format for this. Um, so if, you, if you're trying to think about what you actually want in a container image format, you want to be able to um, discover image provenance. So in particular, um, people care about signing images. Did it, when I downloaded this, did it come from the you know, Nginx container maintainer image? So that's important. Um, the guy who's building the image signs it at build time. And it would be great if that signature you could then verify at runtime. Unfortunately, what happens is your container runtime downloads this tarball, g-unzips un it, extracts it, puts the bits on the file system, and then you throw the tarball away. But the tarball was the thing, the thing that the maintainer signed. So unless you do some additional work with IMA or something, um, you lose that. Um, you want to be able to update stuff. So uh, in particular, uh, a kind of a design annoyance is that suppose if you're a container administrator, you, you're running some giant Kubernetes cluster with gazillions of containers, and there's like 50 different applications, and you're you know you work for a big organization like Cisco, and there's 50 different teams, and each maintains one of those, and then all of a sudden there's a vulnerability in SSL. You, the operator, know okay, I need to go patch SSL everywhere, um, but the uh, you really have no way to do that. We have to go hat in hand to every dev team and say, hey, can you please rebuild an image with this new SSL? That's annoying. Um, it would be great if you could use less space. It would be great if you could just distribute the SSL patch. Um, you could dedupe within an image. Um, that would be great. Um, so basically, for the image provenance solution, what would be ideal is, since this, there's this whole pointer tree, if the guy just signs the index, since all this stuff is content addressed, you don't need to know any more than, this, than the signature on the index is valid. And if you're not destroying these tarballs when you extract the, the stuff, then you're not destroying the signature metadata, and that's useful. Um, so for example, in these two little uh, things here, you could use SquashFS instead of tar as just a, a straw man. Um, and SquashFS, if you're familiar with it, is basically um, it's a mountable read-only file system. Uh, it's, I think the kernel documentation says this. It's intended for general read-only file system use for archival use, for example, in cases where tar.gz may be used. So it's basically intended to be a drop-in replacement for this thing 
um, we're already doing. The, the nice thing about this is the metadata is stored separately. So for tar, the metadata is stored in line. So if you want to read a file at the end of the archive, there's nothing at the beginning that says there are 15 files in this archive and the 15th file starts here. So you have to just keep reading the whole archive, which is annoying. So SquashFS, the metadata is stored separately, which means this whole thing is seekable. Um, you can also uh, do parallel compression if you're familiar with like downloading large like gigabytes and gigabytes of container images. Um, the single threadedness of gzip becomes very painful. Um, so how do we implement something like this? So basically, we want to use SquashFS for uh, the, the actual layer parts. Um, and when we do a, a, instead of mounting something uh, or extracting it and throwing the tarball away, we would just mount it directly out of the OCI image. So there's no, nothing's lost. With the signature on the index, we haven't destroyed that SquashFS squash image, so we can verify that the, the, guy, the thing the guy built is the thing that we're running now. Um, yeah, uh, so uh, also then one of the other goals of this uh, was updating. So if you think about there's a kind of a, a spectrum. And so on one end of the set spectrum, when you get an image from your development team, uh, it's a Docker image, say, and that is bit for bit what the development team ran and tested, which is one of the things that people really loved about Docker because um, now, then they know exactly this is the thing you want to deploy. And on the un other end of the spectrum, um, there's uh, traditional application packaging, which is uh, you say, I want SSL, and you don't specify a version at all. And maybe that version of SSL, there's some thing where it doesn't provide a symbol that this thing needs, and that's where you can get into weird dependency hell issues. And that's why people like Docker, is because they never have to solve that problem. The ops people don't ever have to solve this dependency hell for the develop what was the version on the developer's machine different than mine. Mm -hmm. Um, but unfortunately, that is um, different than you know what uh, what what you what you want out of Docker is is really sort of something in the middle here, where I can change out specific versions of things if I know where they are in this in the layer stack, but it's not all the way back to dependency hell. Maybe you know you say I'm using this version of Python or whatever. Uh, and the administrator can go build his own version of Python with, with the single patch applied and then stick it in, and that would work. Um, so we, that's kind of what we want. So if we're, if we're trying to do a strategy for container updates, you might have two Docker files. Um, you know, they're, they're two different applications, so they both require OpenSSL and Python. You clone one of them, you clone the other one, then you run their install scripts, and now you've generated a container. And if, if, you, if, you, if you're just straw manning a different way to do this, you might do it like this. So you have two different uh, layers that you're describing. One is the we start from a CentOS and we add SSL. The other one is we start from a CentOS and we add Python. And then on this side for the app application install, you might say start from CentOS, grab this SSL, grab this Python, and then install my application. And so in, through this way, if you propagate this, this stuff in the OCI metadata, um, then you can uh, tell the operator, hey, we have, um, we have this uh, different way of annotating things, and we know that this particular layer corresponds to this thing. So in pictures, um, if you have a, something like, that looks like this, uh, or a Python 3, I'm going to use blue for uh, SSL and green for Python, um, then the end result is, if we do this apply thing, we stack the SSL on top, then we stack the Python on, then we put the diff from the install. So ultimately, this is sort of how the, the colors correspond. And that's the idea of then the administrator can go in and say, I know this blue layer is, has a bug. I'm going to swap it in for this other layer with this one patch applied that I'm really worried about. Um, so or I guess. Uh, or you can do it with Python, too, I guess is the point here. Um, Thank you. Uh, so, uh, so Tycho mentioned some, some strategies for building images that, that allow you to more flexibly apply updates and, uh, and be sort of more in the middle of that continuum of dependency hell versus everything static and I have to go back to 50, uh, 50 dev teams and ask them to rebuild their images when I need to fix an exploit. And you know, that could be weeks or months. 
and in the meantime, I've, I've, I'm running a cluster that's exploitable, right? Um, so I titled this "Let's Use a Container Runtime." I actually mean let's use Kubernetes. Let's uh, let's use a runtime system that supports this uh, image building and and uh, and mounting scheme. And so, just in a uh, in a nutshell, Tycho's suggesting a layer format that uses SquashFS as the layers. And so instead of unpacking it, you mount it. That's basically it. You you mount the SquashFS uh, in Subsequent overlay overlay FS uh, mount points, and you uh, you don't have this extract step. The extract happens as you read files from the image, just just like with uh, with mounting any squash FS. Um, so this should fit into a, con a container runtime really well. If I've got if I've got Kubernetes running a cryo and uh, and a cryo com cryo compatible runtime. Such as the one that we've built, Cryo LXC, that uses LXC or RunC, the sort of more common one. Um, we should be able to just plug in these images that we've built with SquashFS layers, and uh, ship them and use the regular OCI uh, OCI image management tools uh, and do minimal changes uh, because this is all compliant to the OCI spec. It's basically, the OCI spec for container for, for, for container images. Let's you just say the blobs are any type you want, and the index points to the blobs, and we don't care what happens. Um, in general, though, uh, everything has been has been written and tested for the the way that uh, Tycho described first, where they're uh, gzip tarballs, because um, that's what the original Docker format was, and that's what everybody uses. Um, so yeah, so ideally, uh, the kubelet will talk to cryo. Cryo, this is the red text here is where we have to do something different. It'll uh, pull and mount, and, and uh, so this might be the first time we mentioned AtomFS right here. But this is basically, um, if you if you think of a an overlay, a, a series of overlay FS uh, mounted SquashFS file systems. If you think of that as a different kind of file system, you could call it AtomFS, and you could and you could label each of those layers as a a molecule in an atom or an atom in a molecule, right? Um, but uh, yeah, Tycho just skipped straight to the implementation details of the thing that we have called AtomFS, um, which is fine. Uh, so, and and then uh, the the final point is Creo LXC and or RunC if you're using RunC. We'll just run with that because what Creo does, the the OCI runtime spec interface is hand me an unpacked rootFS, or really hand me a mounted rootFS. But actually, the way I just described that points to some of the some of the bumps along the way. Um, is that the like I mentioned that the the assumptions are are uh, there are a lot of assumptions in the tooling because of the because there's only one way that people have really used this and this is with the, the compressed tarballs in the, in the layers. Um, so for example, uh, Scopeo is a tool for moving around and unpacking. Um, sorry, just just moving around and inspecting OCI images, uh, both local and remote, um, and it assumes that. Uh, uh, is it, let's see. It basically, it's it's assuming that the that layers are compressed and layers should be compressed. And if you if you use it for um, if by default you use it to ship around OCI images with uncompressed layers, it will helpfully compress them for you, which is not what you want if if you're shipping SquashFS layers. Um, some of the tooling sometimes rejects layer types that aren't common, even though the spec says you should accept. Uh, Unknown layer types that's being worked on. Um, this is another example. Umochi is a, another uh, image management tool. Um, just assumes that things need to be compressed, so they try to be helpful by compressing things by default. It's not what you want. Um, and so yeah, I uh, I sort of did a slip where I said um, the OCI runtime spec expects an unpacked rootFS, right? Um, so there's there's sort of a decompress there's an implicit assumption of a decompress step there, which we don't actually have with this this squashFS layer type. You're just mounting it. So there's there's a lot of the architecture of of the Creo project and and the uh, the libraries that it's factored into containers image and containers storage, um, and this is what GitHub.com/containers/image and slash etc. Um, that, that assumes sort of like a decompress and apply diffs step. You're going to decompress this blob, and you're going to apply its diffs to here, and then and then at the end you have an extracted thing. We don't need to do any of that work, and there's uh, 
there's a bit of friction in adding. It's, so what we're adding is not just another way of storing images because of the way that, that it assumes you have to do this. Um, yeah, so th this is something uh, the container storage library implements, implements graph drivers and graph, graph drivers uh, terminology that started out in Docker because the, the layers, if you have um, multiple versions of a, of a container or if you have uh, multiple containers that were built off of an Ubuntu image base or, or a CentOS base image, there's actually a, a directed graph of, of layers. If, you know, there's one base, then two different things were built on top of that, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so if you think of the layers in terms of that graph, the graph driver is the storage, uh, the storage driver that, um, that uh, models that graph of, of image layers. And so it's, it's definitely uh, focusing on the extract step. And uh, yeah, so for running, you're extracting images, or for, for building, you know, for when you're building, you have, a, you have a container that was running um, and you did some commands and then you, you know, you make a snapshot and then you do some more commands and you have a, a diff that you need to, you need to discover the differences between the two file systems and, and make your new layers. Um, so that's the sort of the, what that's referring to as the rent, render diff. I mentioned this. Um, so there are actually a lot of different graph drivers, uh, all for different ways of storing images. You, you can use, uh, uh, thin provisioning type, type file systems, regular file systems, or even just uh, be really inefficient and do lots of copying. Um, and all, again, all of these primitives are very extract step oriented. The, the, uh, the interface for adding a new graph driver into, uh, into Creo is, you know, you, you do a create, you do a delete, uh, you, you apply diffs from, you know, if you get a new layer, you apply the diffs from that layer to get a new thing, and, and then when you get the final image for the container, that's when, when you actually do a mount. Um, everything's in terms of individual layer IDs and, and it's, uh, you know, it's expecting that you will be unpacking and extracting, and like, like Teiko mentioned, that you're doing a, a, a sort of a lossy thing where you extract the tarball, that's the thing that you signed, but what you have at the end of the process is something that you can't check the signature against. Um, so yeah, what we want to be able to do is, is uh, use our new SquashFS tools in, or our new SquashFS Squash style layers in Creo. And the question is sort of how do we patch it? And the, the approach that we're, sort of, that we're taking now, like what you'd like to do is, is there, is there a high level uh, function that says, okay, I've got this image URL and I'm going to create a container from it. And I want to just sort of cut off there and do my special SquashFS thing. Um, but there, it's, it's not quite that easy. There isn't really one place to patch there. There's a, there's code that's, uh, that implements the process of pulling images and saving to storage. And, uh, and there are some assumptions re around that extract step in there um, and using the, the graph driver primitives. And then there's a separate code that handles, uh, this is called the runtime storage server that, that handles uh, actually getting to a place where you have a usable rootFS. And this is doing the extract in, and then amount, and these are two separate things. When in fact we're we're proposing something that doesn't need two steps, right? Right. Yeah. How I'm saying it it uh, it grabs the image, and uh, and the the library downloads it, and then we also extract here and then mount. It's two steps. Um, so we have a. Uh, the, the answer here is that we don't actually know the best way to do this now. We have an approach. Um, we have some ideas. This is certainly something that would be, we'd be interested in talking to, uh, to people in, that, that maintain Creo and the, the uh, Who actually various know how libraries. this code works. Yeah, <laughs> yeah the, for, the, for the best way to do this. Because the, you know, these assumptions that we, we talked, I don't want to say that, we're, that they did it wrong or that we, you know, they made bad assumptions. These were very valid assumptions until we came along and wanted to do something kind of weird with it. And so. You know, maybe there's a better way than, than uh, where we're hacking it in now. Um, also, just to quickly introduce, since uh, it's, it's not entirely related to the, uh, to the image storage format discussions from before, but uh, we wanted to mention that there is a drop-in replacement for Run C that uses LXC. Um, it's just another box. Uh, well, I guess maybe not everyone was here for the diagram talk before. It was a couple hours ago. But um, if if you're thinking of uh, how 
So, so how containers get run in a Kubernetes cluster that uses cryo um, is there's a there's a format for a kubelet to talk to cryo, and that that uh, that's the CRI container runtime interface, um, and then cryo translates that does some work and translates that to the OCI runtime interface spec, which uh, which it then passes to a compliant runtime. Run C is one of them. Um, and we've written another one that will, instead of using the, the libraries that RunC uses, it uses LXC. Um, and, and you may have your own reasons for, for wanting to use LXC. Uh, you know, one reason it might be that you're using it in the cluster for other reasons, and you don't want to have to maintain multiple runtimes. Um, okay, uh, and so now it's time for a demo that Tycho will <laughs> yeah. motivate and... Uh, <laughs> Something like that, so, anyway. So. Okay. Suppose this is the this is the updating thing. So suppose that I have a image where there's some vulnerability that's known. Uh, the one I cooked up is uh, when you run the Python web server, it forks a task that just serves up slash, so you can look at whatever you want. Uh, so anyway, we call that Python three rooted. Um, so suppose you have a, this image and you'd really like to fix it, and with some other version. And if you notice. The bottom two layers here stay the same. The, there's actually a bug in our tooling for generating this. That why the second layer is there uh, that we'll see. So the bottom two layers stay the same, but the top one is fixed. And so this is the idea of the admin knows, you know, how to patch some particular thing. And this one's in the Python standard library. I just hacked the file, but um, you know, you could you could imagine doing anything, any any bug, SSL or whatever. So if I go here, I can. Uh, I can start, so this is going to start, um, oh, whoops, I have to run all this as root, because I'm not cool enough to have unprivileged containers. There, it, work, it works now. Yeah, boo. <laughs> um, so I logged some, this, these errors here are really not errors, this is just for um, debugging purposes, so for the demo. Um, this is actually in the backwards order that I displayed it in the slides, but this is how Creo actually thinks of it. Um, so this is the image, the actual like uh, base rootfs. This is that empty layer, and here's the image with the bug in it. And so um, what I want to do is, if I do a wget, I don't even have unprivileged wget. So if I do this wget, I, you can see, look, I my rooted image, I can grab Etsy issue or whatever file I want off the system. Um, so now I, uh, so if I look at this replace script, you can see here I'm uh, doing a create of this fix.json. So what's in there? Oops, uh, there we go. Okay, so um, the fix, this fix.json basically points at a fixed image. And this fixed image is uh, the one where the administrator has massaged the layers. Um, he doesn't need, if, if the administrator knows because of the OCI annotations, he doesn't need to go back to the developer. He can just say, here, I, I generated a fixed image. So I have this uh, script here that does a replace, which basically just takes one, swaps out the other one. Again, these error messages, now you can see this, these two are the same. This is the same 7.7. Seven, seven. This is the same empty layer here. But now I've, I've generated this fixed one. So if I try and do my wget again, now I get a connection refused because that little bit wasn't there and it, it wasn't exploited. So the idea here is with a little bit of annotation and if we all as a community start thinking a little bit differently about how we design our images, um, we can make life a lot easier for operators. Um, I don't know with that. I think we're done. We'll take questions. Towards the start of your uh, talk, you had Python and uh, OpenSSL kind of like mixed together. Mm -hmm. How how would you deal with conflicts if you had two things that somehow touched the same files? Or very whatever? good question, and and conflicts are a reality that we've we sort of encountered conflicts in two different places. One is like with RPM databases, so that like basically it updates some binary database that says I've installed Python, and then the other one updates a different binary database that says I've installed. Um, SSL, yeah. So that's a conflict where, you know, if if you're 
this is again a little bit, bit more of a philosophical leap here, but if you're building everything from source because you're a big enterprise and you, you have to ship things, there's no real reason you need to ship things as a package, right, as an RPM package. You could just build the OCI layer and ship that instead. And so philosophically, that's what we're doing. The other conflict which, it, we, which uh, we've run into that that doesn't help with is the LD cache. So when you install something, it regenerates the LD cache, and that always conflict, conflicts. And basically, there isn't a great solution to that. So uh, we right now just whitelist that. So uh, a third thing which uh, I've thought about, but we actually only do this with libraries right now, but like some packages add users or add other stuff to text files. You could imagine doing some sort of automated diffing. Um, we don't do any of that, mostly because delving into our application code is scary. So I just did the libraries. <laughs> um, other questions? So when you patched uh, Cryo, uh, for example, recently Container D started to work uh, to have a, a remote snapshotter interface. So different implementations of this snapshotter could exist. Mm -hmm. Would that be possible for Cryo? Did you investigate it or? Uh, I'm not sure I understand your question. The container did recently, they started to add, uh, it's not merged yet, uh, a remote snapshot interface. Okay. So that different implementations of how they will prepare, unpack, and mount uh, the layers can be implemented. Would that be compatible for, with Cryo? So it potentially, um, the question is how, uh, how how what what does that plugin interface look like? So initially, I thought when I first set out to do this, like, cool, I'll just implement another like plugin for container storage or whatever, and and then it'll all just work just fine. But the problem really is that the primitives are phrased in this way of like everybody sort of assumes that you're going to have to process the image in some way. And as a design goal, we don't want to have that step. And so. Uh, I hope. So. I mean, I hope so. But uh, I think, g at least given the way it's worked out, uh, in fact, when I, we started writing the the patches for this uh, talk, um, I thought it was going to be easier than it was. So, um, yeah, I hope so. I haven't seen this particular pull request, but ideally that would be awesome because I think that would mean much less work for us to try and land some of this upstream. If you look, we have some pretty brutal hacks in places uh, in order to make this work. A, pro, a step that processes the image exists, mm -hmm. but in our implementation, uh, not the upstream container D1, we just skip it because it's like we do a fuse mount anyway, uh -huh. so we don't need to process anything. We just need to mount directly. Yeah, so you're having you're doing the same thing that we are. So do you did you do all this the stuff about diffing and all that? Do you have to implement all that stuff? Okay, so then maybe yeah, maybe yes, this will actually help us. Um, other um, questions? One more over here. Oh, yeah. When you're doing all this stuff with um, mounting several layers of SquashFS, am I right in thinking that um, you can only do that if your container runtime is itself privileged? So uh, that you can do the mount? Yes, uh, because nobody has chosen to fight the battle to whitelist SquashFS. Right. Um, I believe overlay you can do unprivileged. Um, so it's we're half done. Um, the other thing is SquashF is, isn't necessarily the best format for this. You can uh, I could imagine some other ones um, that would be even better in terms of, for example, one of the problems that I mentioned this design does not actually solve, which is the the duplication problem. So we just are using SquashFS here as sort of a straw man to like play around with this idea. Um, but if if somebody came by and said, I'm going to write a kernel driver for this other format that's even way better, I'd be happy to switch to that. So um, y yes, you're right that it needs to be privileged. Other questions? Uh, we're out of time. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.